The bedrock beliefs that formed the foundation of international economics have broken down, and the consequences of this are very hard to predict. Two, five, even $10,000 an ounce gold is a stupid, idiotic low price, especially $2,000. This is like uh, crazy. I'm, I am really surprised that it's only at $2,000 right now. Hi, this is Mike Maloney with Adam Taggart once again. And in this video, we're going to ask, is this the time to own gold? And we're going to cover uh, a few different aspects about economics and what is going on over in the Ukraine. Adam, you just sent me a chart here, and this is one amazing chart. So why don't you tell us about this? Thanks, Mike. Yeah, this chart, I think, reflects what's on most people's minds right now is they are watching the price of everything take off. And a number of folks are beginning to, I think, understandably ask the question, hey, are we beginning to see runaway price inflation here? Well, looking at this chart, it's kind of hard not to come to that conclusion. This chart shows the price increase in a number of major raw materials in just the past week. And you'll see here it goes from gold on the, the, the smaller side uh, up about uh, you know five uh, six percent or so, um, all the way up to wheat, which was up forty percent in just the past week. Um, there are a lot of reasons for why this is happening right now. Uh, some of them related to the uncertainty that the war in Ukraine uh, is adding to the mix here, but a lot of this really isn't. It's due to much more structural issues that have been building for a long time in terms of uh, underinvestment in CapEx and a number of these key commodity production sectors. Um, and then obviously the breakdowns that we've had in global supply chains because of COVID and then you know demand coming back online as countries started opening back up again, it's created this sort of perfect storm of uh, limited supply and, and now uh, increased demand where we're you know, seeing the price of, of many key commodities uh, go up by like 15, 20% week after week after week. Um, oil, which went up about 20, 25% over the past week alone, uh, it, it skyrocketed last night in the futures market up to $137 a barrel. That is almost twice what it was trading at at the beginning of 2022, just two short months ago. So Mike, we really do have an inflation problem here right now. And you know, you asked, is this a good time to own gold? I think this is exactly the, the scenario why people who have been buying gold you know, leading up to, to 2022, they've been buying it because they had a fear that something like this could happen. Yeah, well, you know, uh, one of the things that this chart does show is gold has a lot of catching up to do. So there's, there's a lot of performance in the future for uh, whatever things on this chart are lagging, they will eventually catch up to these other things. This is uh, also part of a very, very long-term cycle. Uh, the commodities to equities cycle, where you know equities outperform commodities for a certain period of time, and then it reverses. And commodities have been in a bear market for a long, long time. They have bottomed, and now they are going up and soaring. And economically, when you create a whole bunch of currency, energy gets stored. It doesn't all get released at once. Uh, the inflation is a combination of, uh, you know, in, in the short term, it's a combination of the quantity of currency, uh, the mood of the public, uh, and supply demand. When the demand goes up or if the supply shrinks, uh, that affects prices. Uh, so uh, a lot of this is all of the currency that uh, the world's central banks have created over, you know, since 2008, they've just gone totally insane. And for a long time, that was stored all in the stock markets. Well, I think we have now seen this reversal of the uh, commodities, the, the equities to commodities cycle, and we're on the commodities side and, and commodities should outperform equities for a long time. But what does that mean? That means big inflation. And then when you throw in the uh, war that is happening, Russia and the Ukraine, um, and the destabilization that that has, and so far, uh, Russia is still supplying Europe with uh, a lot of energy, but they have their uh, hands on the spigot. They, they can uh, limit the supply of energy. Uh, when you increase the cost of oil, 
that's basically the cost of your GDP because, you know, Chris Martinson did a, a video last week uh, that was brilliant on the direct correlation of uh, GD, global GDP and the amount of oil that we use. Uh, it, you know, it's the chicken and the egg thing. Does using more oil create more GDP or does having more GDP use up more oil? <laughs> it's, it's all one. So uh, what's your take on that? Well, no doubt at all. I mean, they call oil the master resource for a reason. Um, if you want to have an economy function, you basically need energy to power that. And like it or not, um, oil and hydrocarbons, uh, that is the fuel source that the global economy is still totally addicted to, uh, to actually get the global economy to function. So when those energy input prices go up, the, the cost for everything goes up. So that's why it's so important to watch here. Um, there, there's so much uncertainty that's contributing to this, Mike. And, and when when markets get uncertain, right, capital begins to flee for safe havens. And you mentioned that um, you know a big contributing factor here is is all of the the money print the currency printing that's gone on by the central banks, um, particularly over just the past couple of years. So you have so much currency out there when it tries to flee for safe haven, it tries to go into something that's real and tangible and has actual intrinsic value here. So basically the dynamic is you have a lot more currency elements uh, trying to get themselves uh, into the limited amount of real tangible goods uh, that, that still exist in the world. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. There's another element going on here too, though, Mike, and we're gonna talk about this in just a second with one of the articles we wanna discuss. Um, but, you know, beliefs are getting shaken by what's going on right now um, with, with this war in the Ukraine. Um, beliefs in just sort of how trade, you know, has been conducted historically, um, beliefs in uh, international relations, but also just beliefs around uh, how safe uh, reserves are. So Russia has over uh, 600, 630 billion um, in, in reserves. But half of those were stored outside the country, and the U.S. and its allies have basically frozen that. So all of a sudden, Russia has you know half the financial assets that it thought it did. Right. So um, there's 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 a lot of panic going on, and just you know, I, I know I'm going to get honked here, <laughs> but what money means, right? What people thought was was real good money, good for them, was really just currency units. That had that were someone else's liability, but I think that is what the world is finally waking up to right now. I know, Mike, that you have been yeah. beating this drum for year after year after year, but I think the world is finally now just waking up to this. Yeah, they're going to learn the difference between currency and money. Uh, and this, you know, I, I started this with my book, and I've been trying to uh, uh, get the word out that uh, currency is not money. Uh, the, a store of value is not one of the attributes that currency has to have. And every time uh, they, a government tries printing their way out of a problem, they prove that. And the, th the Russian ruble has just proven that uh, money and currency are two different things and that, that currency doesn't necessarily have to store value. It does for some short periods of time, but for long periods of time, all currencies end up in the trash can. <laughs> so, um, so uh, you know, there's another article on Zero Hedge here. Russian banks are switching to Chinese credit card systems. A American Express uh, joined Visa and MasterCard in suspending Russian operations. Uh, you know, this is one of those nails in the coffin of the global dollar standard. Even though this is happening to the ruble, this is part of people figuring out that this global financial system that is going on, it, 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 there's a lot of like hocus pocus here, uh, stuff just existing in the ether. What, what do you think of all of that? Yeah, I, I think this is just another one of those beliefs that's been shaken here, right? Where, um, uh, you know, first I think, I, I don't know what was in Vladimir Putin's head or whatnot uh, before he decided to, to invade Ukraine, but, um, you know, Currency flows are, are how commerce is conducted here, right? And so mm -hmm. where we're now basically shutting off Russia's ability to, to access the payment platforms that you know, most commerce is done on, it's now having to find new, new opportunities, right? And so 
Uh, China basically, or Russia, you know, pairing more tightly with China here, not a huge surprise, you know, but what this is doing is it is challenging the belief in the dollar as the dominant reserve currency, because we are providing tremendous incentive for those two players uh, to find a way to de-dollarize and to do transactions that are outside of the, the uh, U.S. reserve currency system, but also tying it back to the, the freezing of the, uh, the reserves that I talked about. There's a lot of other nations that are watching what's going on here and saying, you know what, I've got a lot of reserves stored with the U.S. or, or its allies. And yeah, I'm on their good list today, but what if we have a disagreement tomorrow? Well, I don't want to be as vulnerable as Russia is right now. And so I'm going to have to try to find ways to start to de-dollarize. So I, I'm, I'm just mentioning this, that the whole like game board, the whole geopolitical game board has just been shaken up here right now. And even if things resolve quickly in Ukraine, as we all hope they will, there's going to be really long lasting effects uh, trade wise, geopolitical wise, et cetera. But they, they're really going to impact people's attitudes about currency um, and, and, and really begin to wake up at them to the difference that you just mentioned between currency and money. So I'm going to tie this back to our comment at the beginning about why what's going on right now is proving why now is the time to own gold. Because I think the developments that are happening right now are really underscoring the vulnerabilities of treating currency like money, right? That, that people are waking up to the fact that real money has advantages that just sitting, uh, you know, in, in the current fiat currencies we've all been told are, are just fine. Uh, we're realizing that that's not the case. Yeah, you know, um, for years I've been warning that uh, something like this would come one day. This is really shaking. Uh, you know, to quote a friend and colleague of ours, Stephen Feldman, uh, the bedrock beliefs that formed the foundation of international economics have broken down. And the consequences of this are very hard to predict. Well, you know, uh, more than half my net worth is in precious metals. And, you know, I, I still have a very uneasy feeling about everything that is happening. I am worried. Uh, however, I feel that I've done a better job than 99.99% .99 of the population uh, to protect myself against this because, I mean, the, the, idiocy of what, what has gone on with the world's central banks and the way they've been running the economy, uh, um, something like this can break everything. Uh, we've, we've gone on to this um, increasingly fragile system. It's more and more fragile every day, the global financial system. And, um, and uh, Russia being frozen out of half of the assets that it rightfully owns. It's going to cast doubt on currencies everywhere, including the, uh, the global dollar standard, which has been under attack for some time. And so uh, we're going to, to see some amazing stuff happen, happening over the next uh, few months, and hopefully it plays out over years instead of uh, uh, suddenly coming to an end. I'm sorry, I'm laughing about it. I shouldn't be, but, you know, Russia put their nuclear forces on high alert. This is a really dangerous situation. Uh, right. thing well, and, and, and I hope you're right that it, it resolves, you know, somewhat gently o yeah. over a longer period of time. Um, I, I do think, though, that that there's uncomfortable potential that we're going to see an awful lot happen in just the next couple of weeks here. And yeah. certainly all the price volatility we talked about is going to have some pretty near-term ramifications, but also just the unfolding developments that are happening right now in Ukraine or around the Ukraine situation, they are really concerning. And you, you mentioned a huge one, right? Which is that that the the Russia's uh, nuclear uh, stage they, they they they've moved it to you know right they, they've escalated it to uh, whatever it is high alert or whatever we're calling. Um, which could be just the worst case scenario here, but there's all sorts of things that that happen here. It's sort of like the the famous, you know, uh, no uh, battle plan survives first contact with the enemy, or the Mike Tyson. Everybody, Mike Tyson. Everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the mouth the first time. Um, where uh, you know, there's just so many things happening so fast and furious right now that we don't really know what's going to transpire next. Um, there's an article you and I uh, looked at before we started here that maybe we can bring up real quickly um, about this army of, of hackers, basically, that's uh, just sort of been, um, you know, ground sourced 
uh, coming into the, the whole conflict there uh, on both sides. But but it seems like, you know, th hundreds of thousands of hackers around the world who were sympathetic with Ukraine are now basically engaged in volunteer cyber warfare against Russia. Um, and who the hell knows how that's going to end up here, right? So there's just these, you know, massive amounts of, of in, uh, uncertainty that are happening every single day <laughs> that we're really right. not going to be able to predict. So it's going to be a really dicey time for the next couple of weeks until hopefully we get some sort of ceasefire. What do you think, yeah. Mark? Well, this is World War E. This is exactly what I was talking about in uh, my uh, early warning seminar from 2018. Uh, you know, it's electronic warfare. Uh, that if we ever make it to World War III, it starts with World War E. I'm praying that we never get to uh, World War III. Now, the worst thing that could happen in World War E is the whole internet just coming down. Uh, however, all of these hackers, these people live in the internet. This is a major portion of their life, and it would be like them committing suicide uh, to try to bring down uh, the whole internet system, even when it's for, uh, if it was just in, in an area, like if they were going to try and bring down the internet in the U S uh, uh, that would be them sort of committing suicide because they aren't able to operate in something that doesn't exist. And, and the internet is their world. Uh, so, uh, this is another reason that everybody needs to have some protection and diversity. Uh, if you've, you know, it's, it's good to have some cryptocurrencies, but if you're only cryptocurrencies, it's good to have gold and silver. I see precious metals and cryptocurrencies as allies in individual liberty, individual freedom, and uh, two different modes of protection against all of this. Yeah, agreed. All right. Well, you know, I think the key thing here is, is you know, we, we I'm, neither of us is trying to freak people <laughs> out here, but I think we're trying to underscore that the um, the volatility, the uncertainty, the daily surprises that we're you know we're now kind of reading every time we we open the newspaper or log online in the morning. Um, they're probably likely not to stop in, in the next couple of weeks, at least until we have some sort of material resolution into what's going on in Ukraine here. And so we just really need to be staying on our toes and taking these kind of protective measures that you're talking about, Mike. Um, we got a lot to go through still, so I want to just bang through yeah. things pretty quickly here. First, folks, if you appreciate you know, a conscientious exploration of fairly nuanced and complicated topics like this, please just support this channel by hitting the like button, then clicking the subscribe button below. Um, and, you know, Mike, to your point, uh, my earlier point, and then to your point, even if we get the best resolution of this possible in the next couple of weeks or month or two, um, there have been that 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 breaking of some of those core beliefs that we talked about earlier around uh, today's currency regimes, right? And so that itself is going to lend uh, support to gold as an alternative, right? And so I think no matter what happens from here, even the best case scenario is going to be relatively gold positive, right? Uh, in terms of gold's future prospects. Um, now there's all the remaining uncertainty that still exists. You know, we don't know this, 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 this could get a lot worse. It could lag on for a lot longer than we, we, we would hope. And that additional uncertainty is only going to increase the reasons to own gold and, and precious metals. And so I, you know, I, I just, I know yeah. it's a drum. We beat an awful lot on this channel and you've been talking about this literally Mike for decades. Um, but this is the moment where, you know, all those arguments that we were making get put into a bright spotlight and not just for the folks watching this video who, you know, most of folks have been following a lot of your work, Mike, and they, they kind of know this a bit. It's really the rest of the world that is waking up to this for the first time. And I think that is going to be bringing an awful lot of new capital into the precious metal space. So, you know, long story short is, is, is if you've got your gold, you know, good for you, hold on to it. Uh, if you don't feel you've got enough exposure yet, uh, it's probably a very good time to continue adding more. Yes. And, you know, um, in a company meeting that we had a little while ago, uh, I was saying that under these circumstances, 2000 5000 even $10,000 an ounce for gold, if you look at how many ounces exist and how many people there are out there with a lot of capital that want to seek some sort of protection, uh, when you take a look at that, 
two, five, even $10,000 an ounce gold is a stupid, idiotic low price, especially $2,000. This is like uh, crazy. I'm, I am really surprised that it's only at 2000 right now. Uh, so, you know, <clears throat> um, my former business partner, uh, you know, I used to get asked back when, when uh, gold was $600 an ounce, uh, people would say, um, I, I'd give them a whole bunch of information, try to educate them on what's going on in the world. And they'd say, okay, well, just tell me when I should buy. And then I would uh, tell them why. I, I never make recommendations. I tell people what I'm doing. I, uh, when, when gold was a thousand bucks an ounce, I'd give everybody all of this information. Okay, well, just tell me when I should buy. <laughs> I'd say, well, I'm buying right now. You can do what you want. Uh, and when it was $1,500 an ounce, and then my business partner said, you know what they're really saying? They're saying they don't want to buy gold right now. They want to be in stocks. But you know, when something bad happens, when it's going to explode, then let them know. Well, <laughs> the, the, the whole point is you can't trade Armageddon. You can't trade Armageddon. Gold is just an asset that everybody should have, uh, in my opinion. I'm not telling them to buy it. I don't give financial advice. But it's you know precious metals. I, ha I have a tough time justifying purchasing gold when the gold-silver ratio is at these extremes. I still purchase mostly silver. But I find that uh, I am probably less worried about the financial situation going on than 99.999% of the population. So uh, I, I've done what I could over the past couple of decades almost uh, to try and get ready for what is happening right now. So we're going to end this with a meme from Peter Spina. He's a great guy and, uh, uh, and he's got some funny stuff. And this is a bunch of people jumping out of a plane and this is the different currencies. And what is even better, is uh, somebody, Roger Mills, uh, added to that, gold took this picture from the plane. <laughs> All these currencies falling and uh, gold is still up there. <laughs> so I wanna thank you for being with me, Adam. This was great. Always a pleasure, Mike. Stay safe, everyone.